Okay, so I'll start. So what I want to do is just give you an introduction to infinity categories. I don't want to give you any precise definitions today. That'll be later. I'll give you references and then I'm hoping one of you or a couple of you will volunteer and we'll actually get into them. But I just want to give you a high level interview, in, introduction to in, infinity categories. So what exactly are they? Um, so okay, so I was going through this book, right? Because we've been doing type theory, and I want to kind of, I don't want to go too off, too much off on a tangent. Um, and so one of the first things this book says in chapter two is that uh, homotopy type theory declares types as spaces, um, or higher group voids in category theory. And so homotopy type theory. Somehow types are spaces, but not spaces as we usually think about spaces from point set topology. Um, so homotopy type theory uh, declares that types are spaces in homotopy theory. Or equivalently, higher group voids in category theory. That's a much better term, thank you. Yeah. Right, so, what does this mean? So, spaces, quote. They're not the spaces we think about, uh, which is the, the point set topology spaces. They're kind of a loosening of that notion. We only care about homotopy properties of, of the space. Okay, and somehow equivalently, they're going to be higher group voids in category theory. Um, right. So, so what I want to do is talk about what this means. What is a higher group void? Um, so, group void. So let's start with a zero group void. So a zero group void is a set. So we think of a zero group void as just a set. Um, a one group void is a category where every morphism is invertible. Every arrow is invertible. And so we want to talk about higher group voids. So what's a two group void? What's a three group void? And so on, right? So two group void, three group void, so on, all the way up to infinity group voids. And so category theory really doesn't, it's still an evolving field. There's no like one answer for, for all of these questions. Um, we do have one category that's pretty much set. Um, but higher categories are still a work in progress. And there is one motivating and kind of guiding principle in higher categories. And that's called Grothendieck's homotopy hypothesis. That kind of motivates these definitions. So let's, go, let's talk about that for a little bit. So Grothendieck's homotopy hypothesis. So what I'm about to say, I took out of some notes by John Baez. He's at UC Irvine. No, Riverside. Um, so, right, so if we look at a one group void, 
It's a regular category where the arrows are invertible. So these higher categories, these higher group points, the infinity group points, should be some kind of infinity category with some kind of with an invertibility property. Like everything's invertible. Okay, so an infinity category that should, keyword here, should formalize the following notion. Notion of a thing. <laughs> a meta process between things. Meta meta process. So if I have a meta process and another meta process, there should be one way to relate. There should be a way to relate the two. Uh, a meta. Meta process. And so on. Meta, let's say, meta cubed process. And so in this case, now you have maybe two of these double arrows and they're related to double arrows. So the picture looks something like this. You got two things, two meta processes. So on. So you should formalize all these things, right? You just keep going. So relations between relations between relations and so on. Do you have an example of yeah, I'm gonna get um yeah, right now. So okay. So any space X should give rise to one of these things. Any space should give rise to one of these things as follows. <coughs> so if I have a space, I could talk about the things in a space as its points. A meta process would be a path between two points. A meta meta process would be a homotopy, and so on. So, if I have some space, let's call it X. We could talk about points as its things. Now, a meta process, if I think of X as a path, a path is a continuous map from the closed interval into our space X. So, another path, let's say, beta from the same to this point. We can talk about relating an alpha to beta by a homotopy. So a homotopy, the capital H, can look something like this. If the interval cross itself into X, where H of um, we fix the first parameter and let the second parameter vary. So the second parameter is zero, it's going to be alpha. And if the second parameter is one, we want it to be beta. So, so where alpha and beta are these two paths, right? Well, you'd have, you'd have, you'd have two paths, alpha and beta. So is the missing spot like the T parameter you'd pass to the two paths? Right. So if I fix the zero, what I, what I will get should be a path. So this blank spot is the time parameter. Here's the time parameter for the beta path. Of course, it's all continuous. It's continuous, it's continuous. And then, so, this, um, but then you can talk about a homotopy between homotopies. So suppose I have a second homotopy. Right, let's see. Um, 
Right, so homotopy between homotopy looks something like this. So let's say H tilde. Zero one plus zero one So homotopy between homotopy looks something like this, and we have three intervals. And if I fix, let's say the first two, if I let the first two parameters vary, so H tilde, let the first two parameters vary, and say I fix the third one to zero, that should be the starting point of this homotopy. So it says left all the way around. But I lost track of who was the, the is the first homotopy the one that's called capital H and the second one you haven't drawn. Is that right? The second one I haven't drawn, so let me draw it. There's a path alpha. Here's a path alpha. Here's a second path beta. And suppose I have a homotopy, let's say, call it H1. So I'll call this homotopy H1, going from alpha to beta. But suppose I have another homotopy, H2, also going from alpha to beta. What I'm trying to describe here is a homotopy between H1 and H2. So let's call it H tilde. Okay, so it has something of this form where I fix the parameter, let's say the third parameter is zero, I want it to look like, I want it to be H1. And if I fix the third parameter to one, I want it to be H2. I should call it H0 or H1. So would you permit me to, to articulate what I think is happening and then you can correct me so that I understand it better? Uh -huh. If I think of this as like a Ziploc bag and I have the outside alpha edge and the outside beta edge, I could zip them together from left to right and that would be one homotopy where I'm identifying on one edge. Uh -huh. Or I could zip it right to left and identify it with a second homotopy. At the end they both close uh -huh. and so they're both equivalent homotopies even though they're different ways that I identify the two. Is that roughly an accurate way of thinking of what H tilde is doing? Is this relating how one way of combining A to B became equivalent enough to how another way was? Kind of, but it also reminds me of something. So, right, so, okay, kind of. So, right, so you have a zip log bag, right? You can put one side beta on the other side, and this is the way you're dipping H1. But now, if you look at this definition, this is invertible. These homotopies are invertible. You can just Right, so this is starting at alpha and ending in beta, but you can just reverse it by just playing with, you can just reverse the time parameter. Okay. Um, and so you can, all these homotopies are invertible. So that sounded to me like, uh, your example sounded to me like it's inverting like for each one. Unzipping it, I guess, would be that you could unzip it in the same order you zipped it. it be, but I'm not trying to push that metaphor too strongly. I'm just trying to understand why would you make an H tilde? And it seems like there might be several ways you could equate alpha to beta, and you want them to sort of be thought of as equivalent ways of having done it, even though they're not equal on the nodes. Mm -hmm. So this is like a drawing picture. Oops. If you have a better one than Ziploc bags, I'm totally fine to accept it. And you could do like a straight line homotopy between alpha and beta, and then just pick any other homotopy, and then H tilde could take you from straight line to that other one. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's a good example. Right, there we go. So I was just living in a lot of R2. Um, if I'm just in the plane, I pick two points. Um, so I have alpha and I have beta. So these are two paths right? starting at this point and ending at this point. And so a straight line homotopy, let's say H1. Will look something like this. Uh, this is where you do like S times alpha T, one minus S beta T. Yeah. For S and 
zero one. Yeah. Yeah, this will do. This is a straight white homotopy. Right, so it's basically just doing every point here and the corresponding point here is just going to do that. Okay. Then you could raise s like a power, and that would still work. So then the like That's solar parameter is like the power of s. So you could have a second homotopy H2, which is S squared alpha D yep. plus 1 minus S squared. Oh, I see. And that still hits 0 and 1, but for X, 0 squared and 1 squared, yeah. Uh huh. So then that'll still reach them being equal at the end. But they're different parameterizations of how we got there. There we go. Okay, yeah, that works. So these are two ways to zip the bag, and then we're saying. What's H the home? tilde is the thing between H1 and H2. Yeah, it's like the parameter for S. Like you could just take S to the T, and instead of 0 to 1, now you're doing like 1 to 2 just to make it more obvious. For the third parameter, I mean. Oh, so like H tilde you could define as like now 0, 1 cross 0, 1 cross 1 to 2. Oh. And the 1 to 2 could be the power for S. Oh. Oh, look at that. Super clever. <laughs> It just works out lucky. Well, it doesn't just work out. You thought about it. Okay, I'm impressed. Okay. Say again, what's happening here with one, two? That's the power of S. The the exponent on S is one in the first parameterization and two in the second. Oh, so you just, See? You just vary the exponent. Yeah. Slide dog. So they do a linear interpolation with the next one. Yep. So, for everybody who's watching, so right this is the genius that came up with that. <laughs> So we'll call these paths H of S, or, or H of uh, K for an exponent, right? You could define H1 as as being, that, that little sub 1 is now a parameter K. And you, you just define S to the K, put the Ks for all those ones, and just define a general thing called HK. Yeah, there we go. Define a general homotopy that would work for any one of those. So that's a whole family of homotopies, and then we're homotoping between them by changing the k parameter between one and two. So that's a little hk, which will be substituted as by h tilde. The k is the starting point. Yeah. Just, I mean, we could do a minus one to make it back to zero, one, or something. Yeah. But. Okay. And we can keep going. So, okay, so this is a homotopy between homotopies. We can we can add a fourth parameter. Okay. All right, come on. Okay. And if I if I can just be the person who doesn't want this to be continuous at some point, I kind of only cared about the endpoints, right? Like, do I really need a continuous process here to talk about this picture like this? No, and I'll get to that. Okay. Okay. So. I'm gonna I have to interrupt yeah. and ask a very, very like early question to all of this. What work is being like like what are the characters what are the relevant characteristics of something being a homotopy that are important right now? Like what I, I don't understand I don't know enough I, I'm not familiar for that word. If there are there specific properties that I need to have in mind for what this is doing right now that you could summarize briefly or else I can go read on a plot. So you said invertible, that was right. one thing. I got that part. And and the is you, can always, uh, you can always turn around and go back. Uh -huh. Yeah, if I have a path alpha, yep. I can always walk back. Okay. Is that all? Same well, with these homotopes. Yep. I can always convert all of these yep. things. Um, can I say invertible just means you can always undo it? You go back. Yeah, okay. Um, so it's capturing the kind of relations, right? The relations between objects, and then relations between relations, and yep. so on. Um, and topologically, what this thing is encoding is our, all the like, fundamental groups, all the, all the homotopy groups. So in homotopy theory, what, what people care about are homotopy groups, so spaces. And this object here, if you go all the way up to infinity, like all these homotopes up to infinity, you're going to capture all the homotopy information. I mean, I would be comfortable leaving it, it being invertible if your goal was to go back to groupoid, where you said it's just the invertible stuff. Uh -huh. Right. So in some sense, I feel like you can't add to that. 
I'm not saying you're, that you can't. I'm just saying if your goal was to stay true to this idea that you take some generalized thing and you take its invertibles, whatever those are, uh -huh. and these are the groupoids, the higher groupoids, then I feel like homotopy has to be grounded in just that equivalent. Yeah, we talked about that, right? gives you a way of detecting problems in your space too, right? Like if I put a hole between those paths, between alpha and beta, now I can't actually homotope between those two. Okay. It is a structure of some kind, yeah. yeah. Like if I have an annulus, for example, I'm going to take two points here and here. Here's a path. Here's another path. You're not going to find a homotope between the two. So there's genuinely two different ways for those two points to be related to each other. So it's the subtlety of equivalence, not being always interchangeable. So I, I'm going to read this off of Wikipedia. And it's oh, right. On the right place. <laughs> There's two mappings that are homotopic if one can be continuously deformed into the other. Yep. That's what we're talking about right now, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Except I'm, I'm arguing to drop the continuous word. Okay. Yeah, we'll drop it soon. This is his motivation. <laughs> but they can be deformed into each other. It's deformed, yeah. yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Is everybody speaking up with the questions they have? There's really no reason to soldier on without everybody here. Okay. okay. So coming back to this, right, we want to go. We want to take this picture all the way up to any number of products. So there. And so, whatever this thing is. This infinity category. So it should be an infinity groupoid. Everything's invertible, right? No, shouldn't it be that an infinity groupoid is an infinity category? Are you talking about this specific example of an infinity category? Yeah, this specific. This specific. No, but I thought the I thought the order was you have a groupoid is an infinite is a groupoid is a category with extra. So it shouldn't yeah. the implication be the other way around? An infinity category should be a, a groupoid should be an infinity category. Okay. <laughs> I, I think what he's saying is this example that we just this here. Oh, it's just the homotopy thing. example yeah. is all oh, oh. Maybe. We'll buy that. Okay. And so this is what we want to call the fundamental, not fundamental group, but fundamental infinity group word. Of X. Capital by infinity X. Can I ask a really like basic question about infinity here? Uh -huh. So I think of infinity in two ways. One is that it doesn't have a bound, and then it's just that there's always a big enough end that I can truncate at. Yeah. And then there's like a limit, where I think of the limit ordinal, and I actually have to reach that. Is this take a limit kind of infinity, or is this just you can always find a big enough one? There's no bound. You just keep it OK, so it's a count. OK, thank you. OK, going back, right, so we're motivating infinity categories, um, and we want them to somehow some version of it should be an infinity groupoid, that should somehow be equivalent to space. Um, but given a space, it gives rise to one of these, these structures. Um, and we, it, whatever this is, should be an example of an infin infinity category. Not only that, it should be an infinity groupoid. Um, and we want to call this thing the fundamental infinity groupoid. And this is still undefined because we haven't defined either. Of I haven't defined anything. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, okay, so the homotopy hypothesis asks the following question To what extent are spaces the same as infinity groups? So let's back, let's back up a bit. Let's just talk about, let's just stop the process right here at H2O. So let's just look at sort of the 
fundamental infinity groupoid, let's look at the fundamental one groupoid of space. Let's look at pi one of space. So what is that? Objects are points. In morphism, and from x to some other point x prime should be what? It's a, Anything else? We just talked about this big structure now, but I want to collapse this to a one category, right? So I want to collapse every dimension of the ray. So not just the path, but homotopy class of that path. Homotopy class of paths. Right? So we say, right, so two paths, if I have two paths, F, let's say alpha and beta, we can say alpha is equivalent to beta if there's a homotopy taking one to the other. So I can deform one to the other. Of course, we can't do it all the time. Right, so morphism from x to x prime is a homotopy class of paths. It's an equivalent class. Okay, so it turns out that there is there is a Q functor of pi one from top into groupoid. So top is the category, it's the two categories of the objects are spaces. Uh, the one morphisms are uh, continuous maps, and the two morphisms are homotopies between continuous maps. And this is the category of this groupoid. So the objects are groupoids, one groupoids. The morphisms are functors, um, and the maps and um, the two morphisms are uh, natural transformations between the. And so there is a two functor, right, but that goes from top to group by this. It does exactly right this bit of this. It sends objects to objects, and then you have to check that it sends continuous maps to functors and so on. Um, right, but and I don't, I don't want to get into the details here, but the point here is. Um, there is a way to think of a group by as a space, so meaning there is some way of going backwards. And it turns out that this way of going backwards is going to give you an equivalent between these two categories. Meaning that the, two, the category of, um, sorry, that's not right. Uh, yeah, there is a way of going backwards. Let me just say that. So given a space, we can construct a group weight out of it. But now, how do we think of a group as a space? In some ways, going backwards. And so this brings us now to. Okay, the two functor part was because you truncated at two, right? That's that's what you created equivalent classes of just homotopies, right? And if you're truncated somewhere else, then you'd expect that two to change as well. I'm just trying to see if I track what you said. Why did I care about the two-ness of that functor rather than just saying there's a functor between them? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, For that matter, does everybody know what we've said to each other when we said a two-functor? Do we remember no, those? Definitely not Probably should say something about it. Maybe that's not for today, no, but we should that. definitely have someone volunteer to tell us about two-functors in the next week or so. So there, there is a, there is a well-defined notion of a two-category, and so I don't want to define it, but so we know what spaces equation. are continuous maps and homotopies between them. We know what categories, functors, and natural transformations. Right? So the two-categories are well-defined. Uh, there's there's work by Tom Leinster. That, there's some really nice there's a really nice book that explains two-categories by Leinster. But I don't want to get into that. The point is there is some way of. Applying to every space, 
the fundamental groupoid. And now I want to get to the homotopy of homotopy hypothesis. How do we think that groupoid is spaces? Just at the one level. Um, and the way we go backwards is by the Eilenberg McLean construction. Given a group boy, we can construct a space of G as follows. So we're going to have a vertex that's back for each object of G. And then we're going to have an edge for each morphism in G. And then we're going to put a triangle in for every pair of composable arrows. So suppose I have an arrow F followed by an arrow G. And I can compose them at first then G. We think of this as a triangle. And keep going, a tetrahedron for every triple uh, of composable morphisms. So if I have an F, a G, and an H, let me make a tetrahedron out of this thing. So this arrow here is the composition, F and G. This arrow here, let's call out the composition G, then H. And then I have that back edge. Like that's a triple F, G, H. So anything that can be used in tracks. Yeah. But everything's invertible, right? Because it's still on the group void. Everything's invertible. So then, doesn't that mean that I just look at the connected components and just one dot for each? One for each equivalent class? Right? If I have invertible, I compose invertible to the invertible. So then I'm going to have basically everything in one giant contractible high order simplex. I can track that down. And then I just have one dot for every equivalence class in that category. Yeah, but then you also um, contract, you know, the morphisms down. You have one dot, but then like arrow would be quite interesting. Oh, because you have higher order relations. This is where the two functory business comes in. I see. You have higher order relations. Got it. Okay. Well, so you still, still so G is just that. the one category. All the morphisms are invertible. Well, then I don't see the other stuff happening. How can I have a morphism that's invertible and not have that contract? The, the annulus? Yeah, yeah, the annulus. Yeah. 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 No, I don't understand how to draw a picture that doesn't contract. I don't understand how to draw a groupoid that is that picture. Well, this, there's a groupoid associated with this thing. The objects are the points of the annulus, and the morphisms are homotopy classes of them. That give you a group. Because that isn't the composable pair of morphisms. Is that the idea? They're just not equivalent. They're not the same class. So, like, you might get a filled in triangle on the space of the tetrahedron, right? But you might have one that's not filled in that corresponds to, like, the different classes of the map. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so 
Thank you, Jan. Yeah. You can get an that path gives you an, an edge, and that bottom path gives you another edge. Right? And so that means you have some kind of cycle now in your group where there's no way both of them together. They're not equivalent. So because right, when you construct a space, you're going to get an actual cycle. No, you can't feel it. So this just happens to be a case where all the points happen to be on an annulus, but in the end, it's still every point is just an equivalence relation. It's just the equivalence class. I mean, it's just a high, it's a very dense picture, but if you gave me a discrete picture with five points and you put equivalence classes between there, the equivalence classes track to a point. Yeah, you can think of this, this would be equivalent to the category of a single object, and you have like a Z's worth of markers. You know? You couldn't do this kind of collapse. Well, I mean, I think what I'm seeing is it's clear that automorphisms are contracting, but why aren't isomorphisms contracting? Why doesn't the point dot equal to beta contract that way? If everything's invertible, that bottom loop is also invertible, right? Yeah. So then I fill it in. That's what we said to do. Oh, you're saying. Why doesn't that get to fill in under this hypothesis? That I'm just going to compose F with G inverse, and then I compose that now. Well, it, in. it does, but you're not at the identity morphism that the, uh, the first dot, right? So it'll fill in, but you're filled in a triangle that is a G of F, where that G of F is now something distinct. Uh, I think what he's getting at, uh, take a space of three zero cells, each is attached by a one cell. Can you find a groupoid in the preimage of that? Same with take three zero cells? Right. Uh, attach each one with a one cell. Like that? And so for that space, can you find a groupoid in the preimage? Of um, the Seilenberg McLean map. Yeah, is there a groupoid that hits that? Wait, so this must be a groupoid? Or is this a space? That's, That's a space. space. Yeah. That's a space. So it's a punctured triangle, right? It's just the three points and the three edges. Is that the image of some groupoid under the ellenberg mclean construction? It would be three objects, three more systems, and then the equivalent points to the or to the other possibilities. Yeah, if you stick to the ellenberg mclean space, will always have um, arbitrarily high simple sheets. My understanding of Elmer's complaints is you have to keep attaching cells above that, beyond just the skeleton you see. And you could control the homotopy groups to be whatever pi k of this space is this. But you have to keep adding cells above in order to till off these extra relations. And I'm not seeing how we do that if our groupoid is truncated at a one groupoid instead of allowing it to have higher order relations. Yeah, so, okay, let me say something here. Um, I'm going to have to play with this just on my own because I'm, I'm derailing your talk. But I think that, that this is this is something I just am not landing with me yet. But I, I think I understand the general idea. And I want you to get to your punchline. So I don't want you to waste more time on the question because that's what you're saying. So given a group point, there's a way to construct a space out of it. Right. right? So OK, this is the procedure. Um, OK, so, so what, right? So it turns out that when I, when I constructed the space, now I construct a fundamental group point. Right? So I'm going to take a group point, construct a space out of it, and I apply pi 1 again. And it turns out you get something equivalent to G. You take the group point back. Not only that, the space G is what we call a homotopy 1 type. So G is. homotopy one type, meaning all the higher greater than one homotopy groups vanish. So 
this is a truncation problem. When you have a groupoid, the groupoid only captures the fundamental one-dimensional homotopy groups of the space. Okay, if I give you a groupoid and produce a space out of it, the, group, the fundamental groupoid is the same. But the space is only is, is only uh, interested in those one-dimensional homotopy groups, not the higher stuff. So, okay, so coming back to the homotopy hypothesis, um, this in 1B, there is an equivalence of categories. So there is a category of one types. These are spaces. Um, for all the higher homotopy groups vanish, two and higher. And group ones. This, this is precise, you can actually find it. Langster, Langster has papers on this. Paul Langster. So, or, like, so this, or, this one group by gives you this, it's equivalent to these types of spaces, this one type space. So, I mean, if this was a CW complex, if we limited to that, uh -huh. then isn't that defined as to the fundamental groups, like the weak homotopy equivalent or something like this? So is that what one types are, is the CW complexes? Or is it more subtle than that? Yeah, the CW complexes are all the higher homotopy groups. Right, okay. That's the one category picture. So now if we want to go to infinity categories. The idea here is there should be an equivalence between whatever the infinite whatever infinity groupoids are and something on the left hand side. There should be some some category of space. So the hypothesis is that there exist spaces to match the groupoids. Is that the hypothesis in the homotopy hypothesis? Yes. That's okay. Right. Yeah. So this is all precise, it's proved, but now we want this should be the guiding principle for going higher. So now we replace one with n everywhere, or do we replace one with infinity? You can you can put n here. There are n categories, but the problem with n categories is there are dozens of them, and they're really hard to work with. There's no one definition. So again, Time Meister has a survey. He surveyed ten definitions. There are more, but he takes a look at ten. So there are n types, like n categories, but they're extremely hard to work with. But there is something called um, quasi-category, which is what people are working with now. Um, this is what I want to get to, quasi-category. Uh, this was invented by Joy, oh, invented a long time ago, but the theory was worked out by Joy Al and Lori. And like now people are actually starting to use it. It's like it's easy enough to use. Right? It's catching on. Next time, go ahead. Yeah, let's go to n and then infinity. Motivate n and infinity. The homotopy hypothesis in dimension n. If you're going to come up with a theory of n categories, there should be an equivalence. You should have an equivalence. Um, you should have some kind of equivalence called pi n between some category of n types and n groupings. So again, this thing here, n types, they're going to consist of spaces here, CW complexes, whose homotopy groups are higher than n, n plus 1 and higher, all vanish. And it's going to be some kind of marginal n group, whatever that is. So basically, um, yeah, some kind, some kind of definition of n group. Um, 
and then you can go up to infinity. And we should have an equivalent. You come up with some infinity category definition, you should have some sort of equivalent from infinity type to infinity group. So, this is a place where I don't know enough topology to answer myself, but you said groupoid would be convertible category, but you didn't say small category. So now, is the space on here somehow topology over things that aren't set? <laughs> or are these, just, the size these issues. might be small groupoids now. Okay. To be seen. To be seen. We'll get to that later. Um, okay. So let's talk about infinity categories. Okay. So an infinity category is not one thing. This has confused me for a long time. Um, an infinity category refers to some joint higher generalization. It should, it should generalize the notion of a groupoid, just a one groupoid. It should generalize the notion of a category. It should generalize n groupoids. And there it should, it should have infinity groupoids in there as well. Okay, so, so the word infinity category just refers to any kind of generalization of these ideas. Um, and there are several definitions. But the one that seems to have one out is this quasi-category quasi definition. So quasi-categories so this is a geometric model. For infinity categories. And this theory was worked out by Joel and Jacob Lurie. So if you look in this book, the first few pages are the first few pages are exactly like this. just start defining quasi categories. Although Jacob Lurie doesn't like the word quasi category for some reason, he calls quasi categories infinity categories. <laughs> Which I think is what we're confusing with this other kind of this. It's a geometric model for now, but well, it's actually to be more precise for infinity one category. So infinity one categories are you have all these higher morphisms up to infinity, but the one here stands for the like uh, means that all the one morphisms sorry two morphisms and higher are invertible. So two and higher are invertible, but not necessarily the one morphism. So some special case of a category would be a model for an infinity groupoid, and they're called con complexes. A con complex is a special kind of a quasi category. Con complexes. Uh, is a geometric model for infinity group. And again, this is developed by Joy Allen and Murray. Another great source for this is Emily Real's new book. I think it's called Elements of Infinity Categories. Something. It's something like So I had some kind of, um, uh, I was going to give you some flavor for what a quasi-category feels like. I don't know, we have 10 minutes left. Any questions? Yeah, I'm just a little bit curious about just say like the pi n from n type to n groupoid. 
-huh. This kind of just feels underdetermined. Like, are we not trying to figure out like pi and n type and n groupoid all at the same time? Like, which one of those things do we have a concrete notion of? Because <laughs> like, otherwise, I, I I just feel like it's underdetermined or something. Yeah, so there are n, there are n group ways. So like, okay. there are many definitions. So this is obviously a provide Leinster. So I think yeah, there are many definitions. Which I think all of them satisfy this. Okay. So so it makes sense. Because like in this one, the, the one type it made sense, right? Because you're like, okay, I know what like a one type is, and then you found like, okay, this is the right definition of groupoid, or maybe I have it backwards, but it just seems like so many moving pieces here. And yeah, I guess they're moving, right? Because you want to, yeah, they're they're dependent on each other, so right? Because they're equivalent, so yeah. they're supposed to be equivalent. So yeah, there are definitions, many many definitions. <laughs> okay. So there's there's a ton of moving parts. A ton of moving parts. Okay. Yes. So the premise is because there's many definitions, maybe the differences vanish at infinity. If we go to infinity, we might have a stable definition that sort of all of them become equivalent. Uh, but it's only one random graph. That kind okay. of weirdness, yeah. right? Where when you have infinity, you can tuck in all the weirdness into one general framework. So that's almost like a constraint that like, they should limit down to that thing in some way. Well, if you don't limit down, if you, if you limit to n, then you might keep branching your theories. Mm. But if you take the limit to infinity, then all of a sudden your theories get one universal way of treating it, you can actually hold on to it. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, I know these n groupoids from my field of life and fields like mine, where people are trying to do what does it mean to be equal, right? And so you could say two vector spaces are equal if they have the same dimension. Well, not quite, because what if my set of real numbers is different from your set of real numbers? So it's up to having first identified our two copies of the reals. Then we can start to identify the vector spaces. So then it's sort of like the second layer. Okay. And everything has this feature where you, when you want to say equivalence, it's equivalence up to having already equated a bunch of other things, and where you put that layering. And this seems irrelevant when you're just doing stuff on the chalkboard, but then you sit down and program it. And you import some data from one place in data from another place, and you have to patch up every layer that you have. And it's basically unbounded. I mean, it sucks to be finite, but you're going to go many layers through this like patched up equivalence, and you sit there coding it by hand with like ad hoc choices of who's giving you what. And you'd like to be able to just think of a data structure that's inert to those choices, that just says these are equal now because I've said they're equal in this tower that goes on to however far you need. And people who tried to write that down in computer science were building these n groupoids and finding it difficult to actually model what the computations were doing and make predictions. So they intersected with this group of topologists who were trying to do a different goal altogether, and now they're in a happy marriage okay. trying to compete to finish this story out. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so I think it'd be nice to kind of just explore these definitions, right? Like, what is a quasi category? Just, just, yeah, just what is a quasi category in the con extension, the con complex? Mm -hmm. So here, so this is the definition of quasi category. It's, Actually, a, one, it's a one sentence definition, but the words are. Like, the words will mean nothing. <laughs> yeah. Is this going to lead to us being able to partition the work out to students? Is that the yeah, that's what I'm Go ahead, go yeah. for it. So, okay, so here's the definition that needs to be unpacked. A quasi category is a sequential set that satisfies the weak con condition. Okay, again, so this is like one of the first two definitions of Murray, one of the first two definitions in somebody real. And so, what is a simplicial set? <laughs> so that's maybe the first thing to start with. And then, what does it mean to, to satisfy? Right, so a quasi, where are, the, where are the arrows in here? Where are the yeah. double what arrows? Are how do you compose? Well, the con condition is the compose is, is how you compose. That's a comp composition rule for all the morphisms of space by one. And then, right, so if you want an infinity group boy, it's a special case of an infinity category. So a con complex. Your infinity group weight is a, is just a quasi category satisfying 
the strong con conditions with the con conditions. I think it would be nice just to get through these definitions slowly. Right? What is this? Astrology, you know, what is complex, or what is this? Like, 